أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم خير كلام نطق به أصحاب التوحيد وأبهى مقال صدر عن ألسنة أرباب التجريد حمد واجب الوجود وواهب العقل مفيض الحياء بارئ النفس وملهم الخيرات فالقي أصباح الموجودات من العاليات والسافلات الكيانية من ديجور العدم الصريح الدهري وظلمة البطلان الذاتي وليسيته إلى نور الوجود الذي خص رسوله المصطفى بلواء الحمد والمقام المحمود وجعل تحت لوائه من دونه آدم وذريته في يوم مشهود وأمره بالنصب صاحب راية لو كشف الغطاء مزددت يقينا وآله العظام النجبا لخلافته العظمى ونيابته الكبرى على جميع البرايا ما طلع النجم من أفق السماء ونجم الطلع في بسيط الغبراء صروات الله عليه وعليهم بعدد علمه الذي لا يتناهى بما لا يتناهى حيث قال جل جلاله قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا المودة في القربى وهم عترته الطاهرون ولقد كتبنا في الزبور من بعد الذكر أن الأرض يرثها عبادي الصالحون To proceed This is our first lecture devoted to Ibn Sina's Kitab al-Shifa now, the Kitab al-Shifa is a work of the utmost importance in the history of Islamic thought, in the history, certainly in the history of Islamic philosophy, but I would argue in the history of philosophy in general. Indeed, the contemporary scholar of Ibn Sina and his Shifa, Amos Bertolacci, uses as the subtitle for his seminal study of the reception of Aristotle's metaphysics in Avicenna's Kitab al-Shifa. The subtitle of that work is A Milestone of Western Metaphysical Thought. There are many editions of the Kitab al-Shifa and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but the most famous and widely used edition, it's almost the standard edition of the Kitab al-Shifa, was published in Cairo on the occasion of the 1000th, uh, I think, birth anniversary of Ibn Sina, it says here, بِمُنَاسِبَةَ الذِّكْرَ الْأَلْفِيَةَ لِشَيْخِ الرَّئِيسِ was published in Cairo by Al-Hay'atu Al-Amma Lishu'un Al-Mataba' Al-Amiriya. Um, so it was published by, you know, under official auspices, more or less, in Cairo in the year 1380 of the Hijra, which corresponds to 1960. Uh, it had a foreword and an introduction by Dr. Ibrahim Madkur, and it was presumably critically edited by uh, Father Georges Kanawati. That's how his name would be written in Arabic, Kanawati, but he, I think he was a Shami, and they don't pronounce the letter Qaf in their dialect, so in, in Western works, and he all, uh, wrote in French as well. He would write his name as Georges Anawati with an A. Along with someone named Saeed Zayed. 
Now, without going into too much detail, there are problems with this critical edition, but we don't want to get ahead of the story. So this is the standard edition of the Kitab Shifa. And fortunately for our course, there is an English translation, and it's a dual language text, a parallel English Arabic text translated, introduced, and annotated by Michael E. Marmura. My understanding is that Michael E. Marmura was um, from Al Quds. I don't understand this name, Marmura. It sounds Japanese. Yeah, it says Michael E. Marmura was born in Jerusalem, 1929, etc., etc. So you can read about him if you're interested. But anyway, he's the translator. It's the and the Arabic text which is printed there is based on this Cairo 1380 1960 edition. Now Bertolacci points out in his seminal study, the reception of Aristotle's metaphysics in Avicenna's Kitab al-Shifa, that there are problems with these various editions. And in the um, appendices, in fact, this is Appendix A, towards a critical edition of the Ilahiyat, list of corrections of the Cairo printed text. So Bertolacci has spent a lot of time uh, studying the Shifa, and he has promote, proposed some emendations, some corrections to the text, which... Mind you, he hasn't pulled out of thin air. He has consulted a number of manuscripts as well. And he has suggested these corrections. And if you have this book, you can refer to those. And you can... Um, they're arranged in a table and you can you know, go to your own uh, copy in Arabic and write them in in the margin if you feel like that would be a, a major project. It would take you a couple of weeks probably. It's a very te tedious thing. But it's important that someone has actually sat down and done it. Now, there is another edition, which I would like to bring to your attention. I really think this is the best edition that's out there, but there's only one volume known to me. So, in Iran, um, there was a conference which, w which took place, uh, some sort of international conference devoted to Ibn Sina, which was held in Hamadan um, on the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of the Hijri solar month of Shahrivar, corresponding to 1383 of the Hijri solar calendar at the Donishkohe Abu Ali Sino, you know, the uh, Abu Ali Sina University. And that's when apparently this thing is, is printed. It says Yad you know, in, in commemoration of, of that conference. But it's actually published uh, under, under different imprints. One is uh, uh, jointly under these, these uh, auspices of the Donishkohe Tehran, Tehran University, and the Anjumane, Anjumane, Anjumane Asaro Mafakhire Farhangi. You know, the, um, I don't know, cultural works organization in Iran. I think there's some name for it, official name for it in English. Society for the Appreciation of Cultural Works and Dignitaries is what they, what they call it. Uh, then I think it was reissued under a, a colloquium called the Cordoban Isfahan, colloquium which was on the 27th and 29th April 2002 which I attended um, but anyhow uh, yeah and here it says again Tehran 1383 is the year that's given I don't see any other there's a thing in Iran they usually give the dates and that so it's published as Ashifa al-ilahiyat wa ta'liqat sadr al-muta'allihin alayha ma zurdat al-hawashi min mir damad al-alawi al-khansari sabzawari al-mulla suleiman al-mulla awliya wa ghayruhum so this is a serious edition. Uh, it's an edition of the metaphysical portion of the Shifa, along with the glosses of Mullah Sadra, and uh, the further uh, glosses and notes by Mir Damad and a host of people. I just took their names. And there's also a, a uh, paraphrase, you could say, mm -hmm. of the Kitab al-Shifa, which is given here as well, by Bahauddin Muhammad al-Isfahani, called Aoun Ikhwan Isfa ala Fahmi Kitab al Shifa. Aoun Ikhwan Isfa ala Fahmi Kitab al Shifa. And the problem is that this is only the first volume and it only has the first maqala and I think the second. I think all the whole of the second maqala may be there as well. Now the Shifa is divided into ten maqalas or I suppose what we could call um you know, maqal in modern Arabic means article, but this is more like something like, you know, a discourse. So we could say it's divided into ten discourses. 
And they are of varying length. So the first discourse, Al-Maqalat al-Ula, consists of eight fusul. And in the editions as we have them today, there should be a total of 61 fusuls or sections or chapters spread over 10 investigations or maqalas. But according to the paraphrase, Aun Ikhwan al Safa, there are 62 fusuls or 62. So maybe he had a slightly different version or maybe there was a different division. But this is a very, very important and useful edition. And I, I really don't know what happened if they published any others. I mean, if they're going to do it like this, you know, with the same size, then it, it could easily be, you know, five, six, seven, eight volumes. And this monumental work was done by someone named Dr. Hamid Naji, Hamid Naji Isfahani. Hamid, you know, Al Naji Al Isfahani, if you want to say his name in the Arabic way. He's a very serious scholar of uh, philosophy of the Masha'i school. Um, you may have heard of the famous work on the nature of time by Mir Damad called the Kitab al Qabasat. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there's a commentary on the Kitab al Qabasat by Sayyid Ahmad al Alawi, and that was critically edited by Hamid Naji Isfahani as well. And that was published you know, under the same auspices in Iran. It was, it was also, interestingly enough, published in, in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia from the uh, International Islamic, uh, the Institute of Islamic Thought and Civilization. I have that version here because I used to work there back in the day. Um, so Dr. Hamid Naji Isfahani has written a very nice introduction to the Shifa in both English, uh, sorry, in both Arabic, excuse me, and in Persian. And he has an Arabic and Persian introduction to this Sharh of the Kitab al-Qabasat as well. Then both of them are important if you can read Arabic or Persian, because he talks a lot about uh, these works and their history and the history of Islamic philosophy and the commentaries on them. And um, so he makes you know, some interesting remarks. Um, he says, for example, in this introduction, this is the, as I said, there's an Arabic introduction and a Persian introduction, both. And... This is the Arabic introduction, for example. It doesn't matter which one we read from, but I, there's a quote. He makes a very interesting remark. He says that um, the Kitab al-Shifa is counted among the Ashmal Athar lil ulum al-Aqliya. You know, it's the most comprehensive work of the rational sciences produced in Islamic thought in general and in Shi'i thought in particular. I think that in the famous biography of uh, Ibn Sina by Sayyid Hussein Nasr, which is one of the chapters, that's the first chapter of Hussein Nasr's famous book, Three Muslim Sages, that, um, you know, the Shifa is supposed to be the largest, you know, encyclopedia, is that what it is? The, mo the largest encyclopedia written by a single author. I, I, that may well be true. I mean, obviously, without having any help. I mean, the modern-day encyclopedias are usually written by teams of people. Um, so... How large is the Shifa in its entirety? The Shifa is, um, is divided really into four large Jumlat. chunks. <laughs> um, well, the four large sections, I don't know what we would call them... Um, uh, and the first part is devoted to logic. No. And he calls them funun. And so under the logic, um, he has nine arts. You know, fun, funun, uh, funun is plural of fun, you know, nine arts. Uh, the, the arts or the, you know, uh, craft, I don't know how you want, of, of, of logic. And then there's the physics. Mm -hmm. And then there is a mathematics section, and then there's ilahiyat, and and there's uh, there's various volumes under each, and you know, the way that the modern book is published, and so this was brought out in Cairo. But the funny thing is, it was never reprinted. Uh, I think after you know it was printed over a number of years, and after that, um, you know, I, I lived in Cairo for many years. I could never find the book there ever, and the only place that that's you know where it's been kept in print is Iran because it's still studied and taught there. So my copy 
It's just a facsimile edition of the Cairo edition printed in Iran in 1405 by the library of Ayatollah al-Uzma al-Marashi al-Najafi. It says right here on the cover, Manshurat Maktabat Ayatollah al-Uzma al-Marashi al-Najafi Qum al-Muqaddas al-Iran 1405. <laughs> so, so the, it you know it's it stayed in print there, uh, and that's the <clears throat> the situation that we have. Uh, so Hamid Naji Isfahani is also of the opinion that um, the Shifa is of, of 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 central importance in the history of uh, philosophy. So he says, for example, in Arabic, he says, وَيَبْدُوا مِنَ الْبُحُوثِ التَّطْبِيقِيَّ لِهَذِي الْمَجْمُوعَةِ وَأَرَسْتُ أَنَّ إِبْنِ سِينَ مَعَ كَوْنِي مُدِينًا لِإِفْكَارَ الْمُعَلِّمُ الْأَوَّلِ لَيْسَ مُسْتَنْسِخًا بَحْتًا لِهَذِي الْأَفْكَارِ So, you know, he, he says that, you know, in the process of doing the research for this, this collection of commentaries that he's published, and his study of the opinions of uh, Aristotle as well, that uh, although Ibn Sina was deeply indebted to Aristotle, he was no mere imitator of Aristotle or someone who was simply um, passing on the teachings of Aristotle you know, to the Arabic-speaking world or recasting them. فَلَوْ أَلْقَيْنَا نَظْرَةً عَابِرَةً عَلَىٰ فُصُولِ بَحْثِ مَا وَرَاءَ الطَّبِيعَةً بِقَلَمْ أَرَسْتُ لَلَاحَظْنَا بِجِلَاءٍ تَنَوْعَ وَسِعَةِ أَبْحَاثِ إِبْنِ سِينَ فِي قِبَالِ الْفَيْلَسُوفَ الْيُنَانِ He says in Arabic. He says, even if we cast a kind of cursory glance at um, <clears throat> uh, the, the sections of the uh, metaphysics of Aristotle, it becomes quite clear the variety or the range of, of, uh, of subjects which Ibn Sina adds to the, the subject become quite clear, even on a cursory sort of investigation or uh, study of the works of Aristotle. And um, then he's got a footnote. He says that, um, I'll just translate it straight away. He says, and this researcher shall at the end of uh, you know this uh, investigation present a detailed study comparing ibn sina and his uh, teachings you know with the uh, opinions of ibn sina to show how how uh, you know this how important this is or how clear this is but i don't know that if he, that he ever did that i have no idea i don't know what happened after this and i even posted a question in this regard uh on a uh, uh on a WhatsApp group, on a forum, and I didn't get any any response, so I don't know if, if, if people just aren't interested or nobody knows. Uh, but I, I really don't know what happened to the other volumes, and it's a pity because this is really very useful. Um, now the um, there are the, the the different commentaries which have been published separately. You know the glosses of Mullah Sadra on on the Shifa are available. You can buy them separately, and the glosses of various other people are as well. But to have it like this, you know, in one volume and and have it all going around in the margins and everything is really, really very useful because the way this is organized is on the right-hand side, you have the text of the Shifa, uh, the words of Ibn Sina. Then on that right-hand side page, you have underneath it the commentaries by various people. And on the left side, you have the very vast com comments made by Mullah Sadra. So you can read a line here and go here. And it, it's, a, it's a different sort of reading. It's not a very modern kind of reading. It's a commentary-based reading. And this is a serious book and you have to sort of work on it and struggle with it. And... Uh, that's uh, really how how these kind of books were were meant to be read. Now, in this regard, I want to also mention that uh, Bertolacci also makes uh, remarks of this kind about um, the um, importance of the metaphysics. Yeah, um, in, in his introduction, he says uh, he says lots of things. And um, he says that, you know, Ibn Sina has transformed, really, uh, the subject of metaphysics. 
uh, as it existed before in, in the works of um, in the writings of uh, Aristotle, and indeed he sort he's uh, opens sort of new doors of investigation and so forth, and that's what his entire study is devoted to, and it's it's a massive book, but it's a very useful and important book. Um, so I think you both I think you you have this book, so if you do. Um, if you look at part two, I'm not going to read out of this. I'm just giving you the reference. Um, in part two, chapter four, yes, chapter four, from about from page 116 to um, I think the end of the chapter, yeah. So all of chapter four, from basically page 116 onwards, that's 116 to page 147. Uh, Bertolacci minutely examines <laughs> the, um, uh, I think, first two or three sections of al maqalat al-Ula, the first discourse, and he provides an outline, and he goes through one by one in terms of what Ibn Sina is trying to do. Okay? So, this is a very useful book to have when studying Ibn Sina. There are two others that are essential. Uh, when studying Ibn Sina's Kitab al-Shifa, excuse me. One, the other book is um, by Robert Wisnowski. It's Avicenna's Metaphysics in Context. The thing is that the way this book is arranged, he's, he's very focused on, on two questions, the doctrine of the soul in Ibn Sina and then the metaphysics of Ibn Sina. And he puts the soul first. And um, you really have to read... Read it, read it in order. I mean, I, I mean, no, no one's going to stop you from skipping around. But the book, I don't really think it's that the two parts of it are independent. This is a very serious book, and it's a very serious book to have uh, as a reference nearby. And the other book is the Metaphysics of Aristotle, because again, Ibn Sina is recasting a lot of the ideas there. Now, none of these books is easy. Uh, the Metaphysics of Aristotle is also a very difficult book, but. Um, Again, Bertolacci has done a great service by providing a detailed analysis, a detailed listing of the passages which are quoted or paraphrased or referred to by Ibn Sina from the Metaphysics of Aristotle. Now, it's true there is another famous book by the professor who was the advisor to Amos Bertolacci at Yale University, and of course that is Dimitri Gutas. So he has a book, um, what's it called? The Introduction to the Reading the Books of Ibn Sina or something like that. It's a famous yeah, book. Sure Sina, I I no, it's called Introduction to Reading, something like that. Um, so if you also have that book and you want to refer to it, fine. Um, I'm just trying to keep things simple because uh, these these three which I've mentioned all directly impinge upon the Shifa. Okay? So... Uh, another couple of words about Ibn Sina. There's um, there's kind of two approaches to Ibn Sina. Now this might be a bit of an oversimplification, but um, it's um, still quite accurate to a great extent. There is one view that sees Ibn Sina as uh, ultimately being motivated by uh, mystical concerns, if that's the right phrase, rather than purely philosophical ones. And this kind of reading or interpretation or take on Ibn Sina is, is uh, synonymous with the name of Henry Corbin, the very famous French Orientalist, who um, was very original, and he's the author of a very famous book in French called On Iranian Islam, which was um, also translated into Persian, Islamic Irani, it's actually four volumes, but when the, I think when it was translated in Iran, I don't think they translated the volume dealing, dealing with the Shaykhis, or maybe they'll do it later. Uh, but it's a very profound work. I, I don't really read French that easily anymore. I supposedly passed exams in it a long time ago, but I would much rather read it in Persian because he has a lot of quotes. So I have the Persian translation. And um, that's a very important work. The, I, I, I do think you can't just dismiss the writings of Korban. I mean, you're, you, you can agree and disagree, but I really think you've got to read them before you come to any conclusion, <laughs> like any book, um, if you want to talk about serious scholarship. But, you know, a lot of people just dismiss things. Um, 
and he wrote a book called Avicenna and the Visionary Recital. Now, Gutes does not like the interpretation that's put forward in that book of Ibn Sina. Uh, so what is this about? So Ibn Sina apparently wrote some so-called visionary recitals. And they are mentioned in, uh, in in Arabic, but my understanding is that they would have been written in Persian, and they're quoted by Nasir al-Din um, or at least one of them is quoted by Nasir al-Din I think, yes, in the commentary that he wrote on al-Isharat wa tanbihat, or remarks and admon admonitions. These are the two most, probably most important works of Ibn Sina. Al-Isharat wa tanbihat, or remarks and admonitions, and al-Shifa, which you can call, most people call it the healing, the metaphysics of the healing. Um... Robert Wisnowski likes to refer to it as the cure. And I think there's some kind of a small joke there. I think that was some sort of a musical group at some point in the past in American popular culture. Or maybe it was a song or something. At any rate, those are his really important uh, works. And so he, Ibn Sina has uh, told these sort of kind of stories. There's one which became, which is called Hayy ibn Yaqdan. There's one called Salaman and Absal. And um, this notion of uh, this title, Hayy ibn Yaqdan, is later taken up by a philosopher in a very different part of the world in a different time and and uh, probably very different in many ways from Ibn Sina. And that's Ibn Tufayl. And he uses, writes this book called Hayy ibn Yaqdan. But this idea of writing these kind of allegorical philosophical stories. So it's philosophy in a different way. It's told as a, as a fable. It's told as its philosophy expounded in a symbolic fashion in the form of a, 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 liber, a, a tale of some sort of, which has symbolism, which leads you to some sort of realization or spiritual liberation. And you find that in a Suhrawardi al-Maqtul as well, and you find a lot of these kind of stories and themes uh, later in, in Sufi literature. Uh, you know, Mantiq um, al-Tayr, the Haft Paykar of... Um, Yes, the Haft Paykar of Nizami. Um, you even find in um, these ideas in, in different Masnavis, you find it in Urdu literature, you find it in early Hindavi and Avadi literature. There's a whole other theme by itself. Um, so, you know, was he more of a mystic than a philosopher? I mean, you can argue about it. Uh, but Gutis is strongly opposed to that reading. At least that's certainly the conclusion you get from reading his... Um, uh, book, you know, uh, which is a kind of introductory work to the re reading of the works of Ibn Sina. I read that book a long time ago. I haven't read the, the, the new edition. I, I acquired it recently. But he doesn't like this understanding of Aristotle. And it seems to be the consensus now among a lot of the big names that have, who work on Ibn Sina that Ibn Sina is, is, you know, much more of an Aristotelian than we thought or something along those lines. But this mystical side is somewhat is somewhat downplayed. All right, so we don't want to spend... Uh, but doesn't he mention that there is a mystical side to his teaching somewhere in his works? I I think I think you you can't avoid that because uh, you know the isharat with tanbihat has a whole section uh, that deals with this um, spiritual domain. So it all comes down to really what it, re it all comes down to what the first chat what the first maqala is. So we might as well just jump in from here. What is philosophy? What is philosophy? What is its end? What is its goal? And I really don't know for sure, but perhaps one reason that people who read Ibn Sina nowadays, at least in the Western Academy, maybe have this kind of a take on him is because of the nature of philosophical study nowadays. So the nature of philosophical study nowadays is that it's primarily an ivory tower academic pursuit. It doesn't really directly impinge upon human life. And, you know, was it really always like that? I mean, do the, and I, I think the answer is no. I think that philosophy uh, ultimately was not meant to be a purely academic pursuit. And I certainly don't think that um, that's what Socrates was doing. I certainly don't think that's what you know. Um, Pre-Socratic, you know, ancient sources, uh, um, ancient uh, figures such as Parmenides were doing. I don't think that's what Plato was involved in, or, or Aristotle, for that matter, or or people who come in in the line of the Platonic, the tradition of the Platonic Academy. People like Proclus, or you know, the later Platonists like Plotinus or Porphyry or Iamblichus. I certainly don't think so. 
I think that uh, they saw philosophy as a kind of um, path that they were on and that there was there were further dimensions to it and that there was a kind of spiritual dimension and indeed there may they may may have even been involved in a kind of um, spiritual praxis akin to the um, um, in, akin to the to the to the uh, concentrated or even severe ascesis or asceticism which we find in, in Sufism and this kind of uh, an argument has been made by a French scholar named Pierre Hadot mm -hmm. and he's written a, a work on it he's a famous scholar of of Plotinus and uh, he wrote a work along these lines and in fact, uh, my colleague Sayyid Sajjad Rizvi even refers to it in um, one of his papers, which he wrote on Mullah Sadra, uh, in which he was also, I think, dealing with this kind of issue, you know, what's the, what's the point of philosophy or something along those lines. So I think that's a very hard, hard to sustain that kind of a view about philosophy, because, you know, philosophy really has to be about, is ultimately about, about looking at these deep questions, questions of, questions of meaning. Aristotle says that human beings have an innate desire to understand. And, um, you know, they they stretch out, literally, I think is what the Greek expression says there in the opening of metaphysics, towards meaning, or, or sorry, towards understanding. And I think it's very hard for human beings to live without meaning or to live a kind of uh, existence which is... Uh, based uh, entirely on banalities and, and, and imbecilic activities. But that's what mu much of modern life has become. Um, there was this um, famous psychiatrist, actually, named Viktor Frankl, who, uh, who actually suffered through the Second World War. He was Jewish. He was in a concentration camp, and he came out of that experience. And he wondered, you know, how is it that some people came out of this experience unscathed, like himself, um, by his own claim, you know, I don't know, I've never met him, I can't, I can't say this is true or what. And then he wrote a book, I think it's called Man's Search for Meaning, and, and he said, well, you know, you, you, you can survive even in a prison or in, in, in the worst possible situations as long as you, you still have some sense of meaning in your life. And uh, philosophy is concerned with ultimate questions of meaning. That's what it's really about. So... Um, but if you just turn it into uh, an academic pursuit for careerism and tenure and uh, attending conferences and uh, you know having very technical discussions, there's nothing wrong with the deep, really deep technical discussions in philosophy. But if they become an end in a, of themselves, then that's really not what philosophy is supposed to be about. Anyhow, so let's jump in then with the first maqala. What about the second? You said two approaches to it. One, yeah, there's the one where he's, you know, just sort of a straight-laced <laughs> philosopher with no mystical inclinations. And I don't know, again, there, there seems to be this idea that there's somehow an, a disconnect or that the two are somehow incompatible. And that's not the case with our Islamic philosophers. I really don't think. I think that to to reduce Ibn Sina down to that is just not... To simply say he's a peripatetic... It's, not, it's just not true. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's not just a, a rational pursuit, a didactic pursuit, a pursuit of just studies and so forth. Mm, everything theoretical. Yeah. Um, there's another reason, though, since you did ask. Okay. <laughs> Ibn Sina was a very prolific writer. Very prolific. And there are writings of his which do not survive. Okay. And so he indicates that what he has set out in the whole encyclopedic work of the Shifa is a is a Masha'i text, is a Masha'i text, a an Aristotelian peripatetic, or, you know, you can use these words, text. But he indicates that there is another philosophy, which is without any sort of without a, any sort of additional, you know, it's, it's the pure thing or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And and he says that that is the philosophy of illumination or it's the philosophy of the Easterners. It depends on how you vowel it. And, 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 and Hussein Nasr has a field day on this and people like Gutas, you know, get all bent out of shape when they hear something like this. And that is that he talks about al-hikmatul mashriqiyya or mushriqiyya. 
And you know that Arabic does not indicate these, these short vowels. So the, the, the meme there could have a fatha on it, or it could have a damma. And in case you're wondering, no, it can't be a kasra. There's no mishriqiyya, okay? <laughs> it's mashriqiyya or mushriqiyya. And if it's mashriqiyya, then it's the philosophy of the Easterners, you know, the place where the sun rises. Mashriq is the place where the sun rises. It's not really, it doesn't really mean the East. Mm -hmm. In Urdu, we say mashriq and maghrib, but Arabs don't say that. If they mean the East, they say sharq, and then they say gharb. But anyhow, Mashriqiyya can also, you could also translate as oriental in the sense that the orient is the place where the sun rises and, and Korban loves this. And Hussein Nasr, you know, Hussein Nasr was a friend of Korban. They worked together, they were colleagues. Um, Korban wrote a history of Islamic philosophy in French. And Hussein Nasr uh, collaborated with him along, on that along with uh, uh, my professor back in the day, Osman Yahya. Uh, Rahmanullah was deceased, who was the editor of the Futuhat al makiya and other works. Um, so Nasr is very, very much in the orbit, so to speak, mm -hmm. of the Oriental philosophy uh, view. And then you could say it, it's Mushriqi, and if it's Mushriqi, then it's the Illuminative philosophy. And again, Hussein Nasr likes that very much, because then he tries to connect it with the philosophy of Shihabuddin al-Suhrawardi, mm -hmm. who doesn't say al-Hikmat al-Mushriqiyya, Mushriqiyya, excuse me, or the illuminated philosophy, he says, Hikmatul Ishraq, he's even more explicit about it. There's, there's no doubt there that Ishraq, Ashraqa, Yushriqa means illumination. And that's his famous book. But he's quite different from Ibn Sina. You know, these guys are not all the same. And I get the feeling that Hussein Nasr sometimes tries to just sort of, you know, blend it all together uh, because of his uh, influence, um, because of his being under the, well, more than being under the, being a follower of uh, Frithjof Shuan, the founder of the, you know, the perennialist school yeah. and the so-called Tariqa Maryamiya and all of these things. Um, so there is that aspect as well. And Ibn Sina said that he actually has written a book called The Philosophy of the Easterners, which is how they usually translate it in English, Hikmat al but it's, it's nowhere to be found. There is some little treatise that's floating around that has that title, but it has none of this, this supposedly, you know, ultimate wisdom in it that, that he seems to indicate. But then the fact is, then what do you do with that indication? He, obviously, if he's saying that, is he making it up? You know, is this all just a big, is, it's not a red herring. There must be something to it. So it's lost. Um, so that's where the situation stands. And you have the, the partisans of each side arguing with each other. <laughs> um, so did Mullah Sadra mention anything about it? Well, you know, Mullah Sadra is his own man. He founds his own sort of school. They all love to use these these terms. Um you know, al ishraq al hikmat al mutaali. I think actually the phrase al hikmat al mutaali may be, may have occurred in Ibn Sina as well somewhere. But anyhow, let's let's not get off on all That's these like a point tangents that, here. Uh, Abdul Rasul Abudiya makes an introduction to Islamic philosophy. Oh, does that he? Was originally used by Ibn Sina. Yeah, I think it's used by him in the in the isharat somewhere. Um, yes. So yes, all of these guys have drawn inspiration from Ibn Sina. So again, that shows you how important he is. He's a he's a pivotal figure in the history of of uh, philosophy, in the history of Western philosophy, in the history of Islamic philosophy. Who wrote he's that a real turning point. Biography of him in English. Okay, there are a couple of biographies since you asked. There is a biography. There's Hussein Nasr in Three Muslim Sages, okay. and you know that may be problematic for some people, but anyway, that's he has written about it. Short. It's short. Then there's a there's a full biography by Goodman, uh, Len Len Goodman uh, is his name right, the man who translated the Hayy bin Yaqdan, yes. and there's an older biography by a man named Suhail Afnan, and there is also a lot of biographical notes which I think are useful also by Said Hussein Nasr in his in his PhD thesis which is published as um, Islamic introduction to cosmological uh, an introduction to Islamic cosmological doctrines. Yeah. Um, and of course, there's that's just in English. There, are, there's other books, but those are the, the the famous books in English, and they're all pretty easy to find. Okay, so if we now jump right into the first maqala, we see that it says here after you know Bismillah rahman rahim and the usual beginnings, he says al maqala tul ula wa hiya thamaniyat fusul. Uh, now he's calling this book one, Marmura, instead of 
instead of discourse, consisting of eight chapters. But before that, there is a little sentence. And when you're looking at this, this is page one, by the way. It's actually page one. Um, and the Arabic and the English have their own page, the same pagination. So all the typography that you see here, this would not have been there in a manuscript. I mean, there might have been some different sizes and different inks. I don't know. I haven't, there's a lot of different manuscripts. So the only thing but I'm before gonna... the word maqala, excuse me, it says, الفن الثالث عشر من كتاب الشفاء في الإلهيات and, and he translates this as the 13th topic on metaphysics of the book of the healing you were going to say something? I was going to say so essentially everything on this page is what Ibn Sina wrote except for that which is in the brackets so الفصل الأفضل and the number one yeah yeah the, the, the usual convention in critical editions nowadays is that if you've got something between square brackets it's not there in the um okay. well they, in the manuscript that he looked at and there's no you know, there's usually footnotes and all this explaining and these rounded off numbers the one yeah that too that too so my point what i would like to draw your attention to is here he uses the word ilahiyat just above the word maqala which he renders as metaphysics but then when he goes on under that it says fibtida'i tarabi mawdu' al-falsafat al-ula on beginning to seek the subject of first philosophy. So first he uses the word ilahiyat. Then he uses the word al-falsafatul ula or first philosophy. And then he goes on, etc., etc. And it says, well, we might as well read it. وَإِذْ قَدْ وَفَقْنَ اللَّهُ وَلِيَ رَحْمَةِ وَالتَّوْفِيقِ فَرَدْنَا مَا وَجِبَ إِرَادْهُ مِنْ مَعَانِ الْعُلُوْ الْمَنْطِقِي وَطَبِعِي وَرِيَاضِيَا فَبِالْحَرِي أَنْ نَشْرَعَ فِي تَعْرِيف Hikmiya. And al Ma'ani al Hikmiya, he's saying, you know, that you know, after we've um, dealt with <clears throat> the logical, natural, and mathematical sciences, it behooves us now to commence making known the ideas of metaphysics. So we've got three terms here Ilahiyat, which he translates as metaphysics, Al Falsafat al Ula, which he translates as first philosophy, and then we have Al Ma'ani al Hikmiya, or the idea of metaphysics. Mm -hmm. physics. So he's using these all interchangeably now why what's going on here well he'll get into this a bit more but metaphysics is seen as being first philosophy al-falsafatul ula in the sense that it's the most fundamental philosophy it's the most most um basic of the philosophical sciences in as much as all of the other philosophical and indeed other sciences in the view of ibn sina rest upon this science, which is metaphysics, which he deems as first philosophy. What? Now, some people mm -hmm. might say, and it is, it, this comes out in the in the glosses of Mullah Sadra as well, that yeah, from the from a from a hierarchical from the point of view of the hierarchy of knowledge, mm -hmm. metaphysics should be first philosophy. But from the point of view of study, mm -hmm. it's actually the most abstract, and therefore it's often the most difficult because uh, human beings tend to move from the concrete to the abstract, and it's not every person who can directly jump to abstract and so in that sense it's not al-falsafat al-ula but it's the last philosophy you were going to say something you wanted to say yeah something? Uh, what, what is the history of this term ilahiyat for metaphysics okay i mean the the source of it seems you know as we say ilah something the mind is bewildered by or bewildered no i don't what do you mean ilahiyat really should be rendered the divine science and you will find in some languages, some Islamic languages, the word ilahiyat becomes theology. So, for example, in Turkey, if you're in the faculty of theology, you're in the ilahiyat faculty. And my guess is it's probably the same in Persian. Is that true in modern Persian? I, I mean... The faculty of theology at Tehran University, was, we could probably do a quick Google search and find out. Uh, I, that's where Shaheed Mutahiri... Studied, uh, yes, or taught. So I wouldn't uh, be surprised if it was called, you know, I don't know, what they say, Shobay, Shobay, Ilahiyat, I don't know about modern Persian. But metaphysics is identified as the divine science because, again, it's the study of being qua being and pure being is God. And so theology in the most general sense 
you know, theo, theo, theology generalis, <laughs> theology, or whatever, however you would say it, general theology, theology in the most general terms is metaphysics. But in terms of the history of that, I don't, I don't know. But I'm just pointing out that here, when you read a translation, since you do have some understanding of Arabic, you should look at this and see, aha, well, and, and I'm not, this isn't a criticism because you have to make decisions when you're translating, but you should be aware of the nuances of these terms. So he's got ilahiya, then he's got al-falsafa al-ula, and then he has al-ma'ani al-hakmiya. All right. So he then begins with the traditional sort of division of philosophy. And you can see that he uses falsafa and hikmah sort of interchangeably. Um, so philosophy, obviously, it's, it's an Arabic word that comes from the Greek, but it's identified in the minds of people like Ibn Sina, and thinkers who come much later, people like Ibn Rushd, with al-hikmah or wisdom. And that's um, not a minor point, because falsafa is not a Quranic term. But it is, but hikmah is a Quranic term. Right? And who, whomsoever has been granted wisdom has been granted abundant good, it says in the Quran, right? Woman util hikmah faqad uti khayran kathira, right? Yutil hikmah man yasha. And yutil hikmah man yasha. And there's many, many um, instances in the Quran. And of course, Al Hakim, the All Wise, is one of the names of God. Al Failasuf is not one of the names of God. <laughs> so you can see why uh, they, they liked uh, this equating of the term hikmah with falsafa and it's not surprising that they're used interchangeably so then he begins by talking about how we approach the philosophical sciences and he says the philosophical sciences has been pointed out elsewhere in our books are divided into theoretical and practical this is the very famous division so you have al-hikmatul al-nazariya al-hikmatul amaliya and al-hikmatul amaliya is basically ethics, ethics, personal yeah. ethics, and then there's uh, there's so-called home economics or the tadbirul politics. manzil or siyasatul manzil, and then there's tadbirul mudan or siyasatul mudan or political economy, and then with the hikmatul nazariya, of course, you've got the mathematical sciences. Mm-hmm. You have Major what else? Philosophy and and metaphysics. Yeah, so you have uh, yeah natural philosophy and. What ta'alima? Ta'alimiya. Ta'alimiya has to do with math- the mathematical <coughs> yeah. sciences. Yeah. Which That's are... what the term Ibn Sina uses, ta'alimiya. So you've got al-hisab, or they sometimes would use the Greek al-arithmatiki. Mm-hmm. Al-hisab is arithmetic, and then you've got uh, geometry or geometry or al-hindisa. Mm-hmm. And you've got al-musiqa. Now, musiqa there means sort of like the mathematical theory of music, so to speak. You know, mm-hmm. the, the vibrating strings and this kind of stuff that the Pythagoras discovered. And passes into the Greek tradition. And then you have astronomy, astrology. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he, in this paragraph, and it's inter- nice that the paragraphs are numbered in this edition, he, he goes through this whole kind of um, analysis of the divisions of philosophy into theoretical and practical. I think that's pretty clear. You guys are familiar with these things. So. I'll ask one question over here. Please. When he says, mm-hmm. What is this that he is exactly referring to? This theoretical faculty of the soul. Well, what do you mean? What is it? It's, it's the theoretical faculty of the soul. I mean, I don't understand your question. He he wants to, he wants it to become actualized. That's why he says bihusul al aql bil fi'l. In the English, it says uh, the attainment of the intellect in act. Mm. So it's the it's the bringing to perfection of the uh, really the theoretical faculty, the rational faculty, okay. in the in the human soul. Um, by 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 uh, by actualizing that potentiality, in other words, by actually acquiring the knowledge of a particular, you know, ma'lum tasawwuri or tasdiqi. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah by by uh, by uh, by actually attaining to conceptual knowledge or not or um, or um, um, that being the first act of the mind, and then the second act of the mind being, of course, judgment. Of, the, the truth or falsity of a proposition. 
And that's what he says. بحصول العلم التصوري والتصديقي بأمور ليست هي هي بأنها أعمال you know on the basis of things which are not you know related to our actions or our states because actions and states and so forth relate to practical <laughs> wisdom <laughs> and their practical wisdom is brought about through it says istikmal al al bil the perfection of the practical faculty marmura says through morals i don't like that yeah. it's through virtue through the practice of the virtues um, through the practice of the virtues Very much in the way that you know Aristotle talks about virtues, for example, in the famous Nicomachean Ethics. Because when you say morals in English, I don't think it. Uh, I think it's you know virtue is, is a stronger and better word. Okay. All right. So now he's just going through all of these different subjects, subjects. and so if you actually staying here on page two, go to paragraph. Uh, six. Mm -hmm. So now he's finally getting to metaphysics. And here, Marmuda doesn't translate it as metaphysics. He says the divine science. Al-ilahiyyata. So it's called al-ilahiyya. It's called, uh, it can even be called al-ilmul ilahi. And here he says al-ilahi and the feminine because he means al-falsafatu al-ilahiya. If it occurs as al-ilahi, then it's al-ilmu al-ilahi. And it can also be al-ilahiyat. These are interchangeable terms. Mm -hmm. All referring to metaphysics as the char characterizing, all of them characterizing metaphysics as the divine science. So it says here that the divine science, al-falsafatu al-ilahiya, or al-ilmu al-ilahi, or theology, or first philosophy, or wisdom, investigates the things that are separable from matter in subsistence and definition. So then he continues on with this. And now here he changes. Now he says, وَقَدْ سَمِعَتَ أَيْضًا أَنَّ الْإِلَاهِ So it's grammatically, grammatically masculine here. But it's no big deal. But, you know, you should still sort of pay attention to these things. Read cl closely. هُوَ الَّذِي يُبْحَثُ فِيهِ عَنِ الْأَسْبَابِ الْأُولَى This is important. You have also heard that the divine science is the one in which the first causes of natural and mathematical existence and what relates to them are investigated. And so also is the cause of causes and principle of principles, namely God exalted be his greatness. Mm. He's not saying that this is what metaphysics is. He's saying this is what you might have heard. Mm. You see, he has not established what metaphysics is or what the subject matter of metaphysics is. And that's what the whole point of this first maqala is about. Mm. That's the goal of this maqala. Um... This fossil, excuse me, of the first Muqam. <clears throat> now here he says, This much is what you would have come to know from the books that have previously come to you. Now, I think here by the books that have previously come to you doesn't mean the outside reading of the reader. Mm -hmm. He's actually referring to the previous parts, the previous sections, the previous... Um, uh, portions of the healing, mm -hmm. the shifa. But from this, it would not have become evident to you what the subject matter of metaphysics really is. Okay? But from this, it would not have become evident to you what the subject matter of metaphysics really is, except for a remark in the Book of Demonstration. Illa ishara jarat fi kitab al-burhan min al-mantiqi in tadakartaha. So, he's saying he made a really brief, he made a reference to this way early on in the book. And the first part of the shifa, the healing, is the logic. Hmm. So Mullah Sadra saves you all the trouble. Other commentators save you the trouble, and they tell you where it is. And I think he, <clears throat> Marmura, yeah, he has Ice, a, Ice God one point two. Yeah, he has a, he has a, he has a footnote. So he's calling it uh, Isagog because that's the word for it in Greek, but that's it's in in Arabic it's Al Madkhal and Isahuji. Uh. The second is given means. in the metaphysics. Oh, sorry. And we couldn't find any in English. Uh, yeah. You won't find in the any. very first volume, the healing in the Isagog 1.2. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, that's not translated into English. Um, so, if you want to know where that is in the Arabic edition, I'll tell you. It's uh, here. Actually, it doesn't say it's in the Madrid. It says, uh, uh, sorry, it's in the Kitab al Burhan, the twelfth maqala, seventh fossil, page one sixty-five to sixty-six. And <clears throat> yeah, Ibn C and uh, Mullah Sadra says. هذه الإشارة قد جرت في الفصل السابع من المقالة الثانية. He doesn't say ثانية عشرة من الفن الخامس. I mean, if you go and you dig around, you can find it. But let's not worry about these different editions and pages and so forth. What does he actually say there? Well, he says a lot. It's actually a rather long passage, and I have the whole thing in Arabic here. Uh, and I translated it into English as well, I think. We'll see how successful it was. So what should I do? Should I read it out in Arabic and then translate it? Okay, it's kind of long. So just read the English part. Well, we've got them both here. So he's talking about the term mawjud and the term wahid. So the term mawjud means the existent thing, and wahid means one or unity. So he says, وَلِأَنَّ الْمَوْجُودَ وَالْوَاحِدِ عَمَّانِ لِجَمِيعِ الْمَوْضُوعَاتِ فَيَجِبُ أَنْ يَكُونَ سَائِرُ الْعُلُومِ تَحْتَ الْعِلْمَ النَّاظِرِ فِيهِمَا And since, quote-unquote, the existent and, quote-unquote, the one are both general terms applicable to all Logical subjects. Remember, this is Kitab al-Burhan. So, al-Mawdu' is al-Mawdu' wal-Mahmul. At least that's the way I understood it. Applicable to all logical subjects. It necessary, necessarily follows that all sciences would be subsumed under the science which investigated them. These two things. Al-Mawjud wal-Wahid. Wali-annahu la mawdu'a أَعَمُّ مِنْهُمَا فَلَا يَجُوزُ أَنْ يَكُونَ الْعِلْمُ النَّاظِرُ النَّاظِرُ أَنْ يَكُونَ الْعِلْمُ النَّاظِرُ فِيهِمَا تَحْتَ الْمِنْ آخَرُ Moreover, since there can be no logical subject more general than these two, therefore, the science which investigates them cannot be subsumed under any other science. Now here is where it gets very wordy. وَلِأَنَّ مَا لَيْسَ مَبْدَأً لِوُجُودِ بَعْضِ الْمَوْجُودَاتِ دُونَ بَعْضٍ بَلْ هُوَ مَبْدَأٌ لِجَمِيعِ الْمَوْجُودِ الْمَعْلُولِ فَلَا يَجُوزُ أَنْ يَكُونَ النَّظَرُ فِيهِ فِي عِلْمٍ مِنَ الْعُلُومِ الْجُزْئِيَةِ Furthermore, that which is not merely the originating principle for some existence with a T to the exclusion of others, but is the originating principle for the totality of contingent existence, it cannot be the case that the study thereof be in one of the particular sciences. Mm-hmm. Or did I just read that? Yeah. Uh... Okay. Well, لأنه يقتضي نسبة الموجود. Okay. It cannot be the case that the study there have been one of the particular sciences, nor could it, in and of itself, constitute the subject matter of one of the particular sciences, for it would, at the same time, entail its relation with all existence, which is a contradiction. And that's in square brackets, the contradiction part. Nor could it constitute the subject matter of a universal general science, since it is not. Uh, a general universal, since mawjud or the one you know construed in this most, he's actually talking about al mabda al ala, as the because he's saying that it's the originating principle. So the originating principle is conceived of here as only negatively conditioned, and therefore cannot come under even any of these, not even a, 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 a so-called universal science. Therefore, knowledge of it could only come under. This, the most general of the sciences. 
Since we have already established that there may be some principles of a particular science which are not by themselves evident, and thus must be established by another science, whether they also be particular like it or ge more general than it, thus we are inexorably led to the most general of the sciences. In other words, if you investigate the term mawjud and the term al-wahid, you are inexorably led to the most general of the sciences, and that the principles of all other sciences must be established by this science, which is metaphysics. And this is a remark. And now he's going to develop this more here in this, in this part of the Shifa. In other words, he's saying that the principles of all other sciences are built upon and ultimately rest upon this one science. And it is, as it were, that all sciences are demonstrable through a chain of interlocking conditional propositions linked back to Metaphysics. So in that sense, it's first philosophy. That's a nice little thing which is there in uh, the beginning, in the earlier portion of the uh, Kitab al-Shifa that he alludes to. Okay, is that clear? Because that that's um, a part of the Arabic is kind of, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, not easy to render into English. I did my best before the class last night and, and produced that, so I, it seems that it has received a reasonably good reception um, right so let's hope we were successful in that so he's saying that um, uh, you've heard different things about what first philosophy is mm -hmm. and uh, before this at least in my book the Kitab al-Shifa I only obli I only I only sort of um, made made a made a passing reference and then moved on in, in the earlier part of the book dealing with logic so what is it, then, that metaphysics is? So in paragraph 9, page 3, أَيْضًا قَدْ كُنْتَ Moreover, you used to hear that there is, he says there is here at hand, in other words, that there exists, that there is such a thing as philosophy in the real sense. The philosophy of, you know, of, of, of that which is truly real. فَلْسَفَةٌ بِالْحَقِيقَةٌ وَفَلْسَفَةٌ أُولَى And see here, it's وَفَلْسَفَةٌ أُولَى Indefinite. And a first philosophy. You'll have to read closely. It's indefinite. Hmm. And that it imparts validation to the principles of the rest of the sciences, وَأَنَّهَا تُفِيدُ تَصْحِيحَ مَبَادِئْ سَائِرُ الْعُلُومِ Yeah, what about تَصْحِيحَ? Validation, yes, that's good. I guess he's trying to say. And that it is in reality wisdom. وَأَنَّهَا هِيَ الْحِكْمَةُ بِالْحَقِيقَةِ وَقَدْ كُنْتَ تَسْمَعْ تَارَةً أَنَّ الْحِكْمَةَ هِيَ أَفْضَلْ هِيَ أَفْضَلُ عِلْمٍ بِأَفْضَلِ مَعْلُومٍ You also used to hear at one time that wisdom is the best knowledge of the best object of knowledge. At another that it is the most correct and perfect knowledge. وَأُخْرَى أَنَّ الْحِكْمَةَ هِيَ الْمَعْرِفَةَ الَّتِي هِيَ أَصَحَّ مَعْرِفَةً وَأَتْقَنْ وَأَتْقَنُهَا uh, the most correct and perfect, and yet another that it is knowledge of the first causes of all things. The first causes of all things. But you did not know what this first philosophy is. So in other words, he's saying you've heard all this stuff about what first philosophy is, but, but what is it really? Uh, and he says that these three definitions, what are the three definitions? Um, or these three designations. So, al-falsafa bil-haqiqa and al-falsafa al-ula and al-hikma bil-haqiqa. These are the three three designations he's referring to. He calls them definitions. Marmura does. And whether these three definitions and attributes, these three designations belong to one art or to different arts, each of which is termed wisdom. So he says that these three are all the same. They're all synonyms for the same thing. 
What we will now we will now show you that this science we are after is first philosophy and that it is absolute wisdom and that the three attributes with which wisdom has been described are the attributes of one art, it being this art. So he doesn't say ilm here, he says the word sina. He uses the word sina. I don't think he's using this in a technical sense. I think he's just using this for variation of style. Sina, you know, strictly speaking in logic, there's a ilm. difference between an ilm and a sina, yeah. but this is obviously an ilm. Because later he's going to show that, you know, that uh, he's going to argue that that um, metaphysics is, of course, concerned with things which are, uh, are, are not um, material. Uh, he, he acknowledges that. And then he says that, you know, that that physics, that metaphysics is concerned with the investigation and the establishing of the of the ultimate causes of things and the establishment of. Uh, it investigates, uh, uh, you know, the existence of God as well. And moreover, that it's a demonstrable science. It's based on Burhan. All of these things come out through these, through the, this, this maqala. Now, here he gets into what's called a subject matter proper to it. It has also become known that for each science, there is a subject matter. And this is what he uses as the word uh, mawdu'ah. Let us now investigate what the subject matter of the science is, and let us consider whether it is the existence of God or not. Now, this is where it gets very confusing. He says that God's existence is not a subject matter of metaphysics. Yeah. Now, why do you think he says that? Well, I mean, he states that, you know, the subject matter is something which is musallam, something which has been accepted. Exactly. And that which is accepted cannot be something which is sought. Right. So he's saying that it's not really the subject matter which is investigated, no. but that which is sought. And this is explained well in, you know, um, this is set out well in the Bertolacci book. Where he talks about talks about this very nicely. Let me find you the page, the context. Mm -hmm. uh, on page one hundred and eighteen of Bertolacci's book, he says, Avicenna introduces the issue of the subject matter of metaphysics, meant as divine science. In the description of natural philosophy and mathematics, in he says 1.2, Avicenna had indicated the subject matter of these disciplines, but had omitted this indication in the text. Of ah, the main point of the Ilahiyat, the first maqala, the first fasl, and this is a reference to the Cairo edition, page 5, lines 1 to 6. That's the reference to the Cairo edition. Is the distinction between subject matter and things searched. You know, the mawdu and the things which are matlub or matluba in, in in metaphysics. A distinction which occurs repeatedly in the ilahiyat, he says. The things searched are called what is sought. He also uses the term murad. So the ultimate principle, al-mabda'ul a'la, and he says this in the Burhan as well, the part which we just translated, that the first principle cannot be the subject matter of metaphysics. Oh, well, look at that. He's got a translation of that part as well here. Yeah, he says, Kitab al Maqala 2, Fasl 7, page 165, line 7 to 10, Cairo edition. Since what is not principle of the existence of some of the existence rather than others, but is rather principle of every caused existent, cannot be investigated in one of the particular sciences, nor can it be itself the subject matter of a particular science, since it conveys a relationship with every existent, nor is it the subject matter of the common universal science, since it is not something common and universal, it is not, its knowledge is necessarily part of this most universal science. So that's pretty wordy in English as well. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy, a cool, you know, a very idiomatically nice way of rendering that. It's easier just to paraphrase it. Mm -hmm. um, so on account of the distinction, Bertolacci continues on the last paragraph on page 119 of his book, on account of the distinction between subject matter and things searched, Ibn Sina proves negatively that God and the ultimate causes, those are the four causes, the material, formal, efficient, and final cause, 
are not the subject matter of metaphysics, but rather things sought or things searched in it, things sought after in it. So the, the existence of the ultimate principle, al-mabda'u al-a'la, or the uh, material, formal, efficient, and final causes, they have to be established first. He says they're not musallam. We that's really what we're going to investigate in uh, in the metaphysics, and that's what we're going to seek after. Now, there is in the physics of Aristotle, as well as in Islamic physics, you know, al-ulum al-tabi'iyya and Islamic philosophy, a proof for the existence of God. God will move over. Yes, but Ibn Sina argues that. The true proof for the existence of God is really only to be sought after and found in metaphysics. And why? He says, well, because, you know, in, in, in a tabi'ah or in physics, yes, you can establish a proof for the existence of God, but only on the basis of al harakatu wa sukun By which he means, of course, you can say movement and, and rest, but again, al haraka in Islamic philosophy, which we translate as motion in Latin would be motus, means more than just change. Motion, rectilinear motion, in other words, motion in a straight line, is a change of place. It's a translation from point A to point B. But they use that as the paradigmatic case to investigate all change, whether quantitative or qualitative. And in the ph traditional philosophy of Aristotle and also Ibn Sina, al haraka was sukun, you know, movement and rest or change was only permitted in accidents. And not every accident. Only four. In maqulat al-kam wal kayf or in English, change was only permitted in the accidents of quantity, quality, quality place, and, addition. and relation. Yeah. And so there was no movement in substance or haraka johariya. That's an idea that comes in Ibn in Mullah Sabra much later. So he's saying that the proof for so the proof which is established for the existence of God is based on these accidents is based on change in the category of place or quantity or quality. And in physics, then they, in traditional physics, they'll, they'll establish the proof of the existence of God on the basis of this, that, well, you know, uh, everything which is subject to change, you know, is, it occurs in time or is originated in time and therefore, you know, God is not originated in time. That's a theological proof. Or they'll say everything, you know, is subject to motion or change. You know, they'll, they'll argue these sorts of things. And they'll say, well, to avoid an infinite regress, which is what it all comes down to in all these proofs, to avoid an infinite regress, uh, there has to be an unmoved mover or an unchained changer or a, a, a pure act, which is the ground of all potency moving to act. Or which is the ground of all potentiality moving toward actuality. And for Ibn Sina, this isn't the best way to prove God. So if he, of course, will say that the study of metaphysics is really the study of al-mawjud or al-wujud as wujud. And the best proof for the existence of God is on the basis of wujud itself. And so then he introduces the distinction between the necessary and the contingent. And again, and he calls this the Burhan al-Siddiqeen or the Demonstration of the superbly voracious. That's how it translated. So can we and he say... uses that phrase in the remarks and admonitions in Al-Isharat with Tanbihat. Mm. So can we say... So that's what he's this... moving towards here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that although the existence of God is not the modu of this ilm, it is the gaya or the, you know, the goal of it. Yeah. It's the thing sought. It is it's the, the matlub. It's the murad. It is the murad. Yeah, it's, it's the thing but sought but and it it's the, the goal. the highest... Highest thing sought, you know, al ghayatul ulya or al ghayatul aqsa. Ultimately, yeah, all of this uh, yeah, establishes that. So, this is uh, important to understand that. 
So don't get confused. He's saying, no, he's not saying that God is not, you know, it sounds strange. He's, oh, well, how is God not the subject of metaphysics? Because he's making a distinction between the moldu of a thing, sorry, not the moldu of a thing, the moldu of a science, the moldu of an ilm, the subject matter of an ilm or a science, and the things sought in that ilm or that science. So after he does this, in um, Al-Maqala Al-Ula, in the second fossil, Ibn Sina proves positively that the subject matter of metaphysics is the existent, insofar as it exists. Al-Mawjood min haythu hawal mawjood. So if you turn to... Mm, I'll try and find it in the Michael Marmura for you as well. But in... Um, so, Ilahiyat, the first maqala, the second fasl, al fasl al thani, in the Cairo edition, it's page 10. On page 10, it'll be line, I think, line 14. That's what he has here. No, this is not right. I would have thought that the page numbers would have been correct in this. Well, I have the English translation. The English translation of Bartolacci is that the solution, he says, solution of the problem of the subject matter, second part, existent, qua existent, is the subject matter of metaphysics. It's got to be on that page. Let's try again. Maybe it's somewhere else on the page. I want to find the Arabic. All right, well, this was not good. Yeah, there's a mistake here. He did not get this right. In the Cairo edition, it's on page 13. He says, فَالْمَوْضُوعُ الْأَوَّلْ لِهَذَا الْعِلْمِ هُوَ الْمَوْجُودِ بِمَا هُوَ مَوْجُودِ So, the subject matter, the true subject matter, first and foremost, of this science, of metaphysics, is the existent qua existent. وَمَطَالِبُهُ الْأُمُورَ الَّتِي تُلْحِقُهُ بِمَا هُوَ مَوْجُودٌ مِنْ غَيْرِ شَرْفٍ So if we want to find that in the Marmura, because I think you guys have the Marmura translation, I'll find it for you. فَظَاهِرُهَا وَمَا الْمَقْدَارِ وَكَذَلِكَ فظاهر لك في هذه الجملة Yeah, we have to do something about these these different editions. This is going to be a problem each time. Because I just realized and see now that the paragraphs also don't match up exactly. وَأَمَّا الْمِقْدَارِ بِالْمَعْنَى الْآخَرِ Okay, so this is eight. فَأَمَّا فَبَيَّنُ Because the paragraphs in the Cairo edition are not numbered. وَكَذَلِكَ فَظَاهِرًا مِنْ هَذِي الْجُمْلَةِ Okay. Page 10 of the Michael Marmura. I've got it for you. I apologize about this. So we're going to have to sort of streamline this or figure out some sort of a conversion chart or something for the page numbers. So if you look on page 10, it says, Fal, on the Arabic, it's the second line in the Marmura edition. And then if you look back on that page in the English, so that's what, paragraph 12 of this book? <clears throat> 
The primary subject matter of this science is hence the existent in as much as it is an existent and the things sought after in this science are those that accompany the existent in as much as it is the existent unconditionally. Min ghayri shart. So there he comes to the definition of philosophy. And that's really what is going on here in these first two, what you call them, fossils of the first maqala. But um, the more fundamental question is then is, well, that's his definition, but what really is philosophy? What is philosophy? Now, there are different definitions that have been given in the Islamic tradition. Doesn't does he say that um, philosophy is wisdom and wisdom is philosophy? Yes, he identifies but philosophy. He identifies philosophy with wisdom and wisdom with philosophy. But if we want to have a, mm, a strict kind of technical definition that delineates what it is as, as a science, there's different definitions that have been given. Of course, philosophy literally as a, as, as, as a word in English, and they just, uh, they just take, you know, it comes from Greek, and they did the same in Arabic. They took it from Greek. And it, it, just, it means it's philosophia, which just means love of wisdom. And that, that term, uh, you know, they say it goes back to Pythagoras, and you know, Pythagoras died in, what, 495 uh, before the Common Era. That's a long time ago. Um, so if you, and they say he was born around 570 before the common era. So if you think about it, that's, you know, a thousand years separates the birth of Pythagoras from the birth of the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If we take his birth to have been 570, if, if we take the year of the elephant to be 570, it could be 571. That's, that's a debate in Sira and Tariq. <laughs> So this is a very sort of old understanding that's with us. But um, what really is the meaning of the term philosophy? And um, of course, our ultimate goal is to is to have Ibn Sina and all, and all this, these guys who precede Mullah Sadr so that we can ultimately understand Mullah Sadr. At least that's the goal of, the, uh, of our immediate goal, at least the people who are physically present in this lecture. Um, and if you look at what definition Mullah Sadra gives, it's a very long definition. He says in the Al Maslakul Awwal of the Kitabul Asfar, I'm using the Hassan, Hassan Zada Amuli edition. There are differences among these editions. Uh, that cannot be our topic here, just so that we know where I'm reading from. Um, and they, they essentially match up. It's just that there, there's a lot of tafawut. There's a lot of variation in the way that the Kitab al-Asfar is divided and the headings and so forth. And the, that indicates problems in the manuscripts and so forth. But So on page 27, it's al-Maslak al-Awwal. في المعارف التي يحتاج إليها الإنسان في جميع العلوم وفي مقدمة وست مراحل. So here he gives a definition of what philosophy is. And he says, اعلم أن الفلسفة استكمال النفس الإنسانية بمعرفة حقائق الموجودات على ما هي عليها والحكم بوجودها تحقيقا بالبراهين لا أخذا بالظن والتقليد. That's pretty big. Uh, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to save some time by just reading the translation that my colleague Sayyid Sajjad Rizvi has given in Mullah Southern Metaphysics, Modulation of Being. Um, uh, yeah, it's published by, by Routledge. First published 2009. Copyright 2009, Sajjad H. Rizvi, page 21. Know that philosophy is the perfecting of the human soul through cognition of the realities of existence, ma'rifat haqaiq al-mawjudat, as they truly are, and through judgments about their being ascertained through demonstration, tahqiqan bil barahin, and not understood through conjecture, bil or adherence to authority, bil taqlid, to the measure of human capacity, hasab al-taqa al-bashariyya. 
That's a nice definition. Allah. Then he changes it. And he says, in shit قُلْتْ And you know, if you like, or uh, if I liked, I could have said, or if you liked, I could have said, نَظْمُ الْعَالَمْ نَظْمًا عَقْلِيًّا عَلَى حَسَبِ الطَّاقَةِ الْبَشَرِيَّةِ لِيَحْصُلَ التَّشَبُّهْ بِالْبَارِي تَعَالَى So what does that mean? It means, you know, arranging, so to speak, systematizing, I suppose, I don't know, the cosmos, the universe, all that is other than God, in some sort of a rational scheme, to the degree human, humanly possible, so that Likeness with God, likeness with the Creator, you know, the imitatio di, the, 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 the imitation of God, so to speak, may be brought about. And then he goes on to explain what that is, you see. And he has the whole idea about the al hikmat al nadariya wal amaliyya and all this. And Ibn Sidi and Mullah Sadra has his understanding of what that means. Um, there's other versions some people say al falsafatu sayruratul insan alaman aqliyan mudahiyan ay mushabihan lil alam al ayni um i heard that in one of the lectures of um there's a a a, a scholar named Ja'far al nimr al sayigh who has lectures on the manzuma of al sabzawari and he says that in the first lecture, I don't know where he got that. I don't think it's in Sabzawari. But that means that philosophy is sayurat <laughs> al-insan, the, the becoming, the process of becoming of the human being or the, the becoming or the metamorphosis, the transformation of the human being into a into a noetic world, alam and aqliyan, you know, from nous, you know, in Latin, a noetic, a noetic domain or noetic dominion, which resembles mudahiyan, mudahiyan's fancy word means mushabihan, which is a reflection or is a uh, parallel kind of reflection of al alam al aini. In other words, the human being becomes a true microcosm reflecting the macrocosm. Oh, or, he, he went on, istikmal al quwwat al nadhari ma'rifat al ashya ala ma hi alayhi wa hasba taqat al bashir. It's more like the Mullah Sadr review. Um, and of course, as he says, you know, there is an ikhtilaf, ikhtilafun fil ibara wa tatabakun fil ma'na. These two might seem to be saying something different, but they are really saying the same thing. So Allah has created each and everything with a final cause, with a telos, a purpose, a goal. The universe is purposive by its very nature. And attainment of the goal of each thing rests upon the realization by each thing of its innate potentialities, evolving a movement from potency to act. So an orange seed becoming the orange. Uh, there's a propensive contingency in a a a Imkan is ta'adadi, as we say, and you have this this process of transformation. So philosophy then is concerned with the um, realization of these potencies in the human being to cause them to become truly human. He says, you know, al-aql bil fa'l Ibn Sina also said, the intellect in act. So there are many different definitions of philosophy. So, for example, Al Kindi, Abu Isha, what was his name? Yeah, uh, Ibn uh, Yaqub Ibn Ishaq Al Kindi says in his treatise on the definitions of things, Risala fi hudud al ashya wa rasumiha. So he mentions different definitions of philosophy. This is uh, all the footnotes of Hassan Zad Amri on the Asfar. He says, Al falsafatu hadduha. He says the ancients divine philosophy in very various ways. One of them was with respect to its etymology. Love of wisdom. 
And so Felisuf, or the word philosopher, is a murakkab. You know, it's a combination of these two parts of the word, and it just means the devotee, or lover of wisdom. Mm -hmm. So there was one is the etymological definition, the other one is <clears throat> definition on the basis of what it does. In al falsafata hiya tashabuh bi afa'alillah. He says here that philosophy is the imitatio di, the imitation of God, to the degree humanly possible. And what they meant by this, Al-Kindi says, is for the human being to become complete or to become perfected in virtuous action. <laughs> now you don't find these things in modern academic philosophy. You find all sorts of uh, people who are professors of philosophy who um, may not have attained to the highest degrees of virtuous action. Because it is merely a theoretical in the modern sense study. An ac purely academic a purely professional pursuit. Jim, the third one. Wahaduha Island min jihati fa'liha. Again, in accordance to its action. Fakalu al inayatu bil maut. In other words, contemplation and cognizance of death. Wal mautu indahum mautani. This is Al-Kindi. It's very interesting to read a guy like Al-Kindi that these words are... He's very long ago. He's like in the... What, uh, what Omeyad period, isn't he? It's very long ago. Abbasid, from what I remember. Is it just after the end of the, end of the Omeyads or is he in the Abbasid period? I don't have a death date here for him. The point is he's very early. So he says, well, motu motan. And death for these Qudama, for the ancient philosophers, was of two kinds. Tabi'i natural death which involves the soul departing from the the employment of the body and the second is the mm, the eradication of desires base desires and this is the, the death which the ancients had in mind, the second one. For the eradication of the baser desires is the path toward virtuous action. For insan. In order that man, al in, 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 so that he, you know the human being can acquire virtues. And it is for this reason that many of the uh, most elect of the ancients said, "Alladhat sharun that uh, um, you know enjoyment, you know. Uh, of this kind um, is is bad, is evil. فَبِالْتِرَارِ أَنَّهُ إِذَا كَانَ لِلنَّفْسِ إِسْتِعْمَالًا And so then they are compelled to say that, well, if the, if the nafs or the soul has sort of two uses, أَحَدُهُمَا hissi, The first being sensate and the other rational or noetic. كَانَ مِمَّا سُمِّ النَّاسِ لَذَّةً مَا يَعْرَضُ فِي الْإِحْسَاسِ So in other words, it's to get away from these sensate pleasures and to become more devoted to what are called al-ladhat al-aqliya ibn sina even has an example of this you know that you know the ultimate sort of enjoyment there are some people who all they live for is are sensual pleasures you know eating and drinking and enjoying the the, the pleasures that are of the five senses of the body and then he says there are however there is a kind of rational, intellectual, or noetic enjoyment or bliss as well. And you don't have to go far to understand this. You find some people who are so devoted to chess, for example, 
And he gives that example. So they're sitting there playing chess, you know, and their mother or their wife or their sister, whoever might call them and say, you know, the food is ready. And the, the servants may even come and put the food right there or the tea or the coffee or whatever it is. And they don't even turn around. They don't even smell it. They don't even react because they're so absorbed with that. And they're so enjoying that that they forego. And they might be hungry. They may have skipped. I mean, they might not have eaten a, 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 a morsel that whole day. Right? So if that is possible, so then there's even higher levels. I mean, uh, you know, in my earlier days when I studied mathematics, there are people, you know, mathematicians like that who will be so absorbed in, you know, algebraic geometry or whatever it is, that they, they, they don't know what, whatever, what really is going on around them. They'll be so deep in, deeply involved in, in that noetic world, that world of the aql. So another definition is minjihatil, uh, minjihatil illa, in terms of its cause. فَقَالُوا صِنَاعَةُ الصِّنَاعَةُ وَحِكْمَةُ الْحِكَمِ And they said that it is the, you know, the, the craft of all crafts, the art of all arts, the wisdom of all wisdom, you know, the ultimate wisdom, the ultimate craft, the ultimate art, the ultimate science. وَحَدُّوهَا أَيْضًا فَقَالُوا الْفَلْسَفَةُ مَعْرِفَةُ الْإِنسَانِ نَفْسَهُ This is a very important one. And they also said that philosophy is self-knowledge. As Imam Ali السلام, said, <clears throat> know thyself, as the Delvin Oracle proclaimed to Socrates. So this self-knowledge, Khud Shenasi, Khud Sazi in Persian. Um, of course, Khud Shenasi is Khud Sazi is the cultivation of the self. And he says, وَهَذَا This is still Al-Kindi. وَهَذَا قَوْلٌ شَرِيفٌ نِهَايَ بَعِيدُ الْغَوْرِ And this is a statement which indicates a very noble end and a sort of very remote and hard thing to attain, I think. مَثَلًا مَقُولٌ الْأَشْيَاءِ ذَا كَنَا دَرْسَمِ Yeah, and he goes on. So there are all of these different definitions of philosophy now it's um, worth quoting a little bit of what Ayatollah Hassan Zad Amli has to say about this and then we can probably this would probably be a good note to conclude on so he mentions all of these things he's quoted Al-Kindi we've heard what Allah Sadra had to say we heard some other people's definitions and then Ayatollah Hassan Zad Amli says here Aqulu ما قالوا في الحد الثالث في الموت. So what they said in the third definition about death. فالموت في الحقيقة هو انقطاع الإنسان عن غيره. Death, in reality, is the cutting off of the human being from that which is other than him. Him, capital H. Or other than him. No, the pronoun goes back to insan here. Okay. Or I could say, Another way of say, talking about death is to say that it is the return of each and every thing to its origin. And the return of every form to its reality. And the mm, evolution, if you like, of the human being towards his creator, al mutawafi iyahu, who has caused him to die. Then he says, "Thumma ma'afadu al kindi fi bayan al had al khamis." And moreover, what uh, or furthermore, what al kindi said in the fifth definition, "When kana haqqan walakin al had al madhkur arfa bi darajat min ma'afadu." What was the fifth one? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, self-knowledge. The fifth one was self-knowledge. So he's referring to that. He says that this definition is a lot high, high, higher than what you know what was said there. 
And here he's referring people to his book on the soul. He has this big fat book on the soul called um, Sarh al Uyun fi Sharh al Uyun. So he, he has um, like 66 little propositions or paragraphs on the soul. And 66, he chose that purposely because that's the abjad equivalent of the word Allah. Because mm -hmm. Alif is one, you've got two lambs, so that's 30 plus 30. And then you've got Ha, which is five, 66. Mm -hmm. And then he wrote a commentary on that. Um, so he says, he explains this further in the 44th paragraph or proposition, sorry, 48th, and where he talks about the parallelism between microcosm and macrocosm. And he says, here I'll only refer to it in brief. And he says in this regard, the, the summary is, al insan أن الإنسان بالفعل هو الذي بلغ إلى كماله الممكن له. It's a very short, sentence, very important. He says that the human being, man, if you like, the human being, in actuality, man in act, you know, capital M, man in act, human being in act. Is that which or he that has reached to the full perfection possible for him? Balaga huwa ladi balaga ila kamalihi al mumkin lahu. Ah. Wahad al kamal, and this perfection, this completion, huwa ma'rifatu al kalimat al wujudiyya is knowledge or gnosis of the existential words which are referred to as the luminous realities as they are through an experiential tasting and an absolutely certain witnessing and through a complete and luminous illumination through a um, casting in you know by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heart as it were I can't do too well on that this is very important and does not refer to merely you know studying their notions as 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 uh, as as istilahat or as nomenclature or technical terms, and that's what we have in, in the modern academy. This dimension is mafqood is completely absent in modern academic study of philosophy. You pass some exams, you learn some, you know, and you get your degree you can, if, if that's what you're studying. And he says, وَقُلْتُ فِي قَصِيدَةِ التَّائِيَةِ الْمُسَمَّى بِيَنْبُوءِ الْحَيَاةِ So Ayatollah Hassan Zadi has a poem which rhymes in the letter Ta, which he calls the um, wellspring of life, يَنْبُوءِ الْحَيَاةِ We'll just read a few lines from this and conclude. It's a nice place to conclude. I'll do my best to translate. Bismillah. تَصَحْ فحت أوراق الصحائف كلها تصفحت أوراق الصحائف كلها excuse me تصفحت أوراق الصحائف كلها فلم أرى فيها غير ما في صحيفتي I flipped the pages of all the books, of all the scriptures. And I found therein nothing but my own scripture. Iqra kitabak. Ah, read your book. Ala surat rahmani jalla jalaluhu. In the form of the All Merciful, may he be sanctified and glorified. Bada hadha al insanu min amshaji nutfati. Uh, so this human being came forth 
in the image of Ar-Rahman because there's a hadith that says خَلَقَ اللَّهُ آدَمَ عَلَى سُورَتِهِ وَفِي رِوَايَةٍ عَلَى سُورَةِ Rahman. Allah created man in his image or in the image of the All-Merciful. وَمَعْرِفَةُ الْإِنسَانِ نَفْسَهُ إِنَّمَا وَمَعْرِفَةُ الْإِنسَانِ نَفْسَهُ إِنَّمَا هي الحد الأعلى للعلوم الرئيسة And the knowledge or the gnosis of the human being, of himself, is none other than the highest uh, boundary for the central sciences or knowledges. للعلوم الرئيسة وَسُبْحَانَ رَبِّي مَا أَعَزَّ عَوَالِمِي this is very much like the poetry of Umar ibn al-Farid, if you don't know the context. Umar ibn al-Farid has a poem called at al kubra The great ode rhyming in the letter Ta, which is very much like this. He's obviously done this in, in, in emulation uh, of, of Umar ibn al-Farid. So he says, Glory be to my Lord, وَسُبْحَانَ رَبِّي مَا أَعَزَّ عَوَالِمِي There is nothing greater than my dominions and my worlds. وَأَعْذَمُ شَانِي Nor greater than myself. Contained within the depths of my structure, my bunya, my making. I think Omar ibn Farad pulls that one off a little bit better. How, how long Omar ibn like Farad? I've never been able to find a copy. Maybe if you want to search around. If you find one, you can share it with us. I'd love to have a copy. But I have... I'm a... Uh, a, a, an admirer of the poetry of Omar al farid he's a very great Sufi poet and yeah it's al farid with a dad you know what a that one dad and he says uh he says um it's a really bizarre one he says uh ilayya yeah ilayya isn't it no rasulan ilayya kuntu minni mursalan وَذَاتِي بِآيَاتِي عَلَيَّ اسْتَدَلَّتِي oh. <laughs> That's a very, very controversial... Ras- <laughs> Rasul, no, he's, he's saying رَسُولًا إِلَيَّ رَسُولًا إِلَيَّ How did it go? رَسُولًا <laughs> إِلَيَّ رَسُولًا إِلَيَّ كُنْتُ مِنِّي مُرْسَلًا Rasulan ilayya, a prophet to me, I was, kuntu minni mursalan, sent from myself to myself. Rasulan ilayya kuntu minni mursalan. Wadati, and my essence, my being, wadati bi ayati, with my own portents, alayya stadallati, points back to me. Inasmuch as the human being who truly realizes. After words, kashf, and, and all of these things and becomes a reflection of God to the degree. So he says to the degree possible, because each person has a different istiadad. Yeah. And this is very important to point out. No one is saying that human that the human being becomes God. No. But one actualizes one's potentialities and then becomes a perfect reflection of the divine names. Which are possible for that person, and each person is different. So the divine names are taught to the Adam, the primordial Adam, you know, Adam symbolic of humanity. And it's only the Prophet Muhammad who is the perfect manifestation of all of the divine names, and then of course the Imams. The difference being that there is no Nubuwa after the Prophet Muhammad. And this is clearly stated in the Quran. Walau kariha al-mu'anidun in Surah Yasin, you know, even even if, if you know stubborn people don't want to accept it, it says, Wa kulla shay'in ahsainahu fi imam mubin. And all things have been enumerated, as it were, in a manifest imam. And I think here we may stop. For after that Quranic verse, there is nothing more that can or should be said. Wallahu a'lam. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.